More to be desired are they than gold, even much by gold. And so, brothers and sisters, you already probably know this, but the rewards of study are equivalent sometimes to the work to extract gold like that. It's hard work. But the desire for the Word of God, the desire to have it, to understand it, to know it, but not just to know the Word of God, I'm going to keep banging on that point because I think it's worth emphasizing to all of our hearts. We're not learning and studying and meditating to know, just to know Scripture. That was the Pharisees' mistake. They knew it backwards and forwards, but they did not know the God of the Word. So I'll put the up on your notes in the second little block there. In order to know the Word of God, you must know the God of the Word. In other words, and that's the order it comes in. First we know God. And then we know His Word. And it's like a relationship. It gives and takes. And so the more we know His Word, the more we know about Him. And the more we know of Him, the more we know of His Word. And it just keeps building and feeding and building and feeding. Well, having said all that, I got done last Sunday night, and I think I went for well over an hour. And I was blasting through this stuff, and I had all these notes in front of me. And I suddenly realized, you didn't have anything to follow And I'm sure if I asked you how much you remembered from last week, you'd all sheep as you say, not very much. So I thought, what I'll do is, I'll give you a set of notes. You can take this with you. There's some practical stuff in there. You can read through it. We'll, we'll kind of skim through it again. I want to get down to the meditating on scripture part, which is number three on page four. If you flip over all the way to page six, there is actually the start of reading, meditating, memorizing the Psalms. We may or may not get there, but I guess we may not. But that's okay. Take it with you. Bring it back next week and we'll go through it and then we'll dive in to start studying and preaching our way through the Psalms. But here's the thing, okay? Like just, just a little time out. You know where we are in the studies on Sunday morning. We're in Acts. Next section is Acts chapter 6. What should you do to get the most out of the sermon on next Sunday morning between here and Sunday morning? Let's get Acts Look at Acts chapter 6. Yeah, read, read ahead. So, the, the more that you're able to read for yourself, so when I come on Sunday morning and we open scriptures and we preach a sermon, and it's not just that, we're, that you're all of a sudden discovering, oh, there's a guy named Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5, the one guy he is, what's all that about? You've already read ahead, and I know one of you did, because he came up and he said, yeah, I saw a different way. And I said, that's cool, because you're seeing that way, I'm seeing this way. And by reading ahead and being in the scriptures for yourself, you might even discover that, Hey, Nelson said something that wasn't quite right. In fact, there's a verse here that maybe you misquoted or misread or you misapplied it. And so you can come to me and say, hey, did you think about this? Because I make mistakes too. So your, your responsibility isn't just to come and like a little bird like feed me. Your responsibility is to be looking ahead, seeing where we're going, you know, tracking through with me and reading and studying ahead for yourself. So you're getting more out of it. If you understand the text before I even start to preach it, you'll get a lot more out of it. So that's the point. Anyway, how do you say all that? Uh, how, who was here last night? Uh, not many of you, okay? So we're going to go through this again. Read the Word of God, number one. Uh, this, this is just practical stuff. Know the Bible you're reading. I mentioned formal equivalent. For those of you who don't know, formal equivalent means word for word translation. So the English translators try to look at the Greek and Hebrew and try to find one equivalent word or the best equivalent word for it. So your ESV, your NASV, your King James Bible, your New King James Bible. Uh, the RSV is a really good one. NRSV, not so great. But the ESV is, is the grandson of the RSV. And that's well regarded one of the best. Those are word for word translations. The translators are trying to find one word to fit every word. Uh, Mr. Taylor's old 1977 NASB, which is what he uses, because I heard him say, being thou and read, so I know where it comes from. That is regarded by scholars when he says it's the pure translation. Don't tell him I said this, but he's pretty close to right. It, it is a very, very good, it's regarded as probably one of the best. Um, and it's still used today, even though it's not in print, so you can find them online that you really expect to buy. That NASP, the new NASP, excellent translations. They're word for word. Dynamic equivalent, NIV, TNIV. The RNIV is the reader's NIV. They give it to little kids. It takes all the big words and breaks them down to small words. If you're new to English, it's a great translation to use. Uh, study Bibles. 
absolutely get a study Bible. Go out and pay the money. Uh, an ESV study Bible, in my humble opinion, is probably worth the money you're going to pay for. That one head is holding the red and black, or you can get the nicer ones in leather. They weigh about nine pounds. They're good for, you know, if you want to work up your muscles, get to the kernel before you read it. Uh, but they are worth their money. They've got so much in them that they'll help you out. Local versions. Read one in the formal equivalent. Read one in the dynamic equivalent. Read an NASB and an NIV. You're going to get the sense, the flow in an NIV, and you get word for word in an NASB. It's a great way to read it together. Moving on, on your page one, read literaturally. Meaning, read understanding the genre of the text that you're reading. There's law, there's history, there's poetry, etc. You can read through those for yourselves. A good study Bible will give you, at the beginning, how to read this kind of literature. We'll look at the end of this or next week and how to read the Psalms, because you don't read the Psalms the same way as you read the Gospel, the same way as you read Revelation. They're different types of literature. They use different devices and so on to communicate differently, so they're read differently. Okay? Genre and literature. Back, page two there. Read historically. Read knowing the history of the text in the book. Who wrote it? Matthew, Mark, and Peter were written by, uh, Mark was written by Mark with a whole lot of input from Peter. Luke, John, Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude, you can go through the whole list. Knowing who wrote it, the Old Testament books, not always easy. Uh, most of the study Bibles will give you some suggestions as to who wrote it. It helps just to know who they were, where they came from, what their background is a little bit. It's just the information that's going to help you understand their perspective as they write. Who was it written to? That's not always clear, and there's even some debate, uh, especially in New Testament epistles. Sometimes they're written to primarily Gentile audiences, sometimes primarily Jewish audience, and sometimes it's both, a mix of both. Knowing that perspective will help you when you read through and go, why does he say that? Or why does he explain that? Why is it that Mark often gives a Latin term for a city or a place, and then he finds it. Why does Matthew so often write, as is written in the book of the prophets, and he quotes a prophet? And then you realize, Matthew's writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, Mark is writing to a predominantly Gentile audience, oh, makes sense, right? And sometimes you'll see supposed inconsistencies from one gospel to the next, like place names is a huge one. Why is that place there and what that place there? Why does one writer say kingdom of God and one writer say kingdom of heaven? Until you realize that the Jews would never say kingdom of God. That was a disrespectful way to speak of God. So Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, is going to say kingdom of heaven, whereas Mark, writing to a Gentile audience, just says kingdom of God. I came from a group of people. God bless them, love them, they love the Lord. They actually came up with a two kingdom theory kingdom of God and a different kingdom of heaven. And it's like, no, sorry, if you compare the translations, you realize you're talking about the same thing. But knowing that perspective helps you to avoid some of those interpretation difficulties. Where was he often located? Paul says, I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't just mean I'm a slave of Christ to serve him. He actually meant as he wrote the chains right across the page as he was writing. He was writing from jail. Knowing that helps. Why was it written? What's its purpose? What's the theme and message? A lot of those answers, if all you have, like Andreas has got a whole King James Bible, and it's got no notes, no margin notes, no references, Andreas can find pretty much every bit of information we're talking about by how? Constantly rereading and just really studying line by line. If all you have is a pure text Bible, those questions can be answered, most of them. Uh, the day one, probably not, but aside from that, you can answer those questions. A good study Bible, for example, the ESV study Bible, will tell you all that. You can skim through the introduction, it'll help you see where you're at and where you're wrong. Um, themes or literary devices the author uses. This is a cool one. Let's see how well you read Bible. Uh, this phrase, and the word of God continued to increase and the disciples multiplied greatly. That's a dividing line in what New Testament book you might know. It's not the one that you're in for a moment. I didn't get the Christian. Okay, on the top of page two, you'll see it says themes or literary devices does the author use. 
The first one there is, and the word of God continued to increase, and the disciples multiplied greatly. That phrase is used repeatedly in one book of the New Testament. You know which word? Thanks. Yep, exactly. Acts. That's how you can tell Luke is dividing off his material in chunks. Uh, this is the account of all. It's an Old Testament book. Breaks up the book into ten parts. Anybody know? No, no, no. This is different from Chronicles of Kings. What did you say? Lord of Zion. No, no, no. Genesis. Genesis. This is the account of the heavens and the earth. This is the account of Noah. This is the account of Adam. You see? And that, those little lines, they're beautiful little written in. They have chapters and verse back there, right? So when you read it, you go, oh, the author is giving us ways to break up the material to understand he's covering certain material between certain Muslim phrases. Uh, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, Yep, Matthew, and it's the Sermon of Mount. Jesus is using that as a breakup. Uh, and when Jesus finished these sayings, it's used five times in one of the Gospels. What do you want to do? John? No. 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 It's not Mark, it's not Luke, and it's not John. Which one is it? Matthew. Matthew, here we go. Uh, Matthew has five great discourses, five great teaching sessions, and at the end of every one he says, and when Jesus finished these things, and he moves on. It's like, ah, Matthew, before chapters and verses were invented, is giving us a, a clue that he's concluding a section of material, and now he's changing course, he's changing his chapter for that. Uh, what shall we say then? Right. <laughs> Good on you. Yeah, this not bad. Okay, is this book part of an ongoing conversation? Uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are in effect historically 2 Corinthians and 4 Corinthians because there's two letters, one before 1 Corinthians and one before 2 Corinthians, which were missing. All we have is those two books that are inspired and recorded and kept for us. But as you're reading, you hear former letter. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, well, I didn't see a former letter to Corinthians. How does that work? And sometimes just knowing these little bits of information helps you to understand what the book's doing. The Word of God is literature, and it's written using literary literary devices and so on. I said last week, read grammatically. Try and no more chapter and verse markings and don't jump out of just find your way around. Walk on that one. Read broadly, one read the Bible as a minimum. If you can read more than that, and the reason why one read through the Bible is a really good thing is constantly going through the Bible over and over and over again is you're going to get a full grasp of the overall story. Read by, uh, sorry, read as quickly as you can and read slowly and painfully. We'll talk about that's meditation is one and just skimming through. I don't mean skim as in just glaze over. I mean like read quickly to get the overall gist of the books. Uh, we have a Bible study series that Heddy uses for the ladies, I've used it for guys. study. The one you're using, George, for guys study. The first chapter, the first point is, read through the whole book in one sitting. Every study will tell you that. You read through the book in one sitting. If you can sit down and take the book of Acts and read through it in one long row, and then do it again, you're going to all of a sudden start seeing there's things, there's connections, there's... there's uh, repeated phrases, there's repeated ideas that come up again and again and again, which if you read like one chapter a day over a month, you're probably not going to pick that up because your memory won't retain So read quickly, read broadly, read and mark your Bible. I mentioned last week how I mark my Bibles really badly. Uh, some of my Bibles have pages that are so marked up you can't, we don't have to actually pull out the page on the top of it just to make it work. There is a way, uh, if you've got a crew on because you look in the front by the Bible section, I don't know what stuff is. <laughs> you can see there's a little box set. Uh, ESV produced these little tiny thin paperback journal and Bibles. You can buy them for like three, four, five bucks each, I think. And you get one like the first John, one with second John, uh, Acts and Romans, whatever. And they have a page of text and a blank page. It's brilliant because you can mark up all over put lines and notes and highlighters, put your own thoughts in the thing, and when you finish, for three bucks, go buy it all, and you keep going. 
So if you, don't, if you have a really nice Bible, a nice leather Bible, you don't want to mark it up the records, but a couple of those too, do that. And that's the way you're, you're interacting, you're engaging with the text. I find, like I said last week, marking nouns and verbs and subjects and objects and prepositions and all those other parts of speech. You say, why do that? Well, because what it does is it forces me to think about what every word is doing in the sentence. And so I can unpack the logic and what the writers say. I can even take some of Paul's 14 verse long sentences, which you will twist your mind, and figure out what's his main thread of an idea through that. And it's almost like figuring out what is the main trunk of the tree and all the other clauses that fit into it. You go, okay, here's his central idea. This is how everything else fits apart. Marking it up like that is one way to do it. Uh, read how to take, mark your Bible, move it over, page three. Use brackets, colored pens, highlighters, do whatever you have to do to mark it up if you want to. We all have computers and, and Bible on computer. Print off a couple of pages of your Bible. Like I do for sermon prep, I'll print off pages and I'll just mark them all up and put notes and highlighter and everything in the page. And sometimes I can bring it right in the pulpit if I'm stuck and I actually use that as a sermon base. It's just a good way to see what the text is doing and saying. Move it on. Read prayerfully. Not just before you start reading it, God will open your eyes to see wonderful things in Scripture. Pray the text of Scripture back to God. Pray it into your life. Pray it into other people's lives. I cannot emphasize how, how incredibly enriching that is to sit in my study with the Bible open. I read through a passage on Ben Taylor, and all of a sudden I'm thinking about Wes and Steve and Peter and George and, and Rosemary and all, everybody else are thinking, you know, they really need to understand this. This needs to be a part of their lives and start praying into your life. What better could we do for each other in our prayer life than to pray scripture into each other's lives? And of course, they will share it too. So read prayerfully, read journalistically, read, get a journal, write notes. I know you guys uh, sit down and you write, you pray, see every paragraph and write some notes. Uh, I'm amazed. I get talking to Rosemary and Peter, and they haven't been reading studying that long, and their grasp of scripture is going like this. Their curve is like that. Why? Partly because they're writing notes. I cannot emphasize enough. You want to get more out of the sermons? Write notes. Uh, I had one of the best times I had in ministry, um, the volunteer too, but there was a girl over at Casey Bible Church, and every time I finished the sermon, she'd come running up the front. She's probably 18, 19, this is four. And she'd have her sermon note sheet, and she had filled every line across the side and down the and she'd say, Now, you said, <laughs> da, 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 da. did you mean this or this? And I was like, Oh, great. She's actually listening, taking notes, and engaging. Uh, note taking, journaling is a fantastic way to get scripture off the page in your heart. Memorizing. I'm actually going to skip most of this. You can read it through. Uh, kind of put most in there. The one thing I would say is if you're struggling to memorize, look down the middle of the bottom of page three. You'll see where it says but, but in, but in these, but in these sacrifices. One of the best ways if you struggle to memorize is memorize one word. Repeat it and add a word. Repeat the two and add a third. Repeat the four and add, just keep going. I can memorize whole rings of Hebrew vocabulary at the school doing that in the training when you're in school. It's a great way to just drill it into your mind. Um, I occasionally sing scripture, and I can't sing it. Not, sometimes the Bible doesn't lend itself that easily to it. But one of the incredible ways, we had a fellow in Canada who was in children ministry with us, and he would teach Bible verses to 120 kids. He'd write a song for every verse. Uh, he was a brilliant musician. But you can do it. You can take the verse, break it down, uh, if it doesn't work uh, melodically and lyrically, you can get up your, uh, your bling and you can rap it. And because rapping a verse, it's okay, come here, see. You can rap a verse, and I'm telling you, doing that and putting it to rhythm and cadence drills it into your head. And so if you can put it to a song you know, or put a hymn you know, or a tune you know to, when you go back and see that tune, I'm telling you, come back like that. That's just simple ways to memorize scripture. Moving on. We want to get on to the best part of all of it. 
Top of page four, meditate on scripture. Luke 2.19, we've been studying Luke on Wednesday nights. Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. How do you meditate on scripture? This is where, the, that was the question started when we were doing this tonight. We read to memorize, memorize to meditate, and meditate on scripture to enact and live out scripture. What is meditation? It's not emptying your mind. That is the Eastern meditation system. It's not biblical. In fact, I would argue strongly, if you practice something like emptying your mind as a form of mental exercise, you are opening yourself up to demonic activity. Wow. Yeah, totally believe that. So don't go down that road. This is not, I actually had someone say to me, I've always heard that meditation is not biblical and not Christian. It's like, Yes, the meditation you're thinking of is, but this is not what the biblical writers mean. Uh, it means to chew over, to wrestle with. Um, as I said before, our world is addicted to amusement and entertainment. To amuse means without thought, without thinking. To muse, the old Puritans used to say they mused on Scripture, meaning that they thought deeply on Scripture. This is the hard work part. This is the digging from gold in thinking hard about scripture. The process of practice, middle of the page, four, you can read the rest um, if you want later, but we take a text, we pray from the Holy Spirit to teach us the scriptures. We fix our thoughts on that text and word by word examine it and think deeply and rigorously about what each word means and how it contributes to the text that's truth. And beyond that, we start asking questions about the text. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do this together. Take your Bibles and flip over to a very little known verse in the book of John, chapter 3. What did you say, huh? Verse 16. Verse 16. Yes, you knew where I was going. Yes. Verse 16. Well known verse in the Bible. I just sat in my study this afternoon while I was putting this together and thought, you know, there's actually a lot more here than I even thought there was. And when you start doing it. So, first thing that we do, this is what I do, and this is one way to do it, is what does each word in the text mean in its context? So, I have the word for, F O R. What does the word for do in the text? Anybody know? John 3 16. First word is for. What does it mean? What does it do? It links to the previous verse. Yes, very good. Okay, what does it do? You're right, it's, it's actually can you call a conjunctive, uh, uh, an inferential conjunction. It is an inference, okay? Or in this particular case, it's also used as an explanation. Okay, so he said something in verse 15, whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For, to explain that, so the word for means there's an explanation coming. Okay, what does the word God do in the sentence? Anybody know what the grammatical form of God is? Do you know what I mean by the form? What type of word is the word God? Now, yes, the so now. So it's the subject of the verse. Very good, English teacher back there. It's the subject of the verse. What is John 3 16 all about? Who is it all about? sentence is the word God. So what is the sentence about? God, yes. Who, for you, I, this is where I went, oh, here's me thinking for the last 40 years that the next verse is about us. It's not. For God so loved the world. That's it. So loved. Do you know what that is? What kind of uh, form that is? Okay. <laughs> yes, right. And that's the degree. It's a hot and pain. What, what uh, type of word is it? Someone said verb. Yeah. The word verb is a verb. Yeah. So love is actually a verb. Hagape is a verb, right? Yeah. So the action is God loved. Well, the object is the the object of his love is the world. Yeah. That introduces something called a relative clause. I don't know, you don't want to go to English class all over again. Kathy's laughing at me. Relative clause explains or expounds or gives extra information about something. For God so loved the world that, well, what about God's love? Well, He gave. What did He give? 
is is a pronoun refers back to God. So one of the ways we know that the subject of the sentence is God is you notice the pronouns refer back to God, or a little bit later it changes to referring to the Son. In fact, the world there doesn't really come into it that much other than the fact that whoever believes in him. So the subject, the main driving idea behind that verse is God loved the world that he gave. And you just keep going through the whole sentence and figure out what does every word do. Um, in school they teach you to do what's called a sentence diagram. Did you wait do this? And this is the only people who do this back when you're in school. Did you do back in school? I caught the record. Did you do it in grade school? Did you? In Canada? We're all Canadians, right? <laughs> they teach you how to do nouns, verbs, and all, and they give up to this like lines and they diagram the whole thing out. If you could ask me, I saw in my office, I had an A4 or A3 paper with Greek paper, and I'll actually diagram whole verses and use colored pencils to figure out the main idea is all the way over on the left. And the further to the right you go, it's a lesser important idea. So I get the main points in my sermon, but always against the left margin. Okay. So in the verse here, for God so loved the world, you've got that part. You can go through and figure out all other parts of words and what they all do, what they all mean. Let's move on. Next point there is the second from the bottom goal point. What do these words line verses tell us about God? Okay, for God. In the beginning, God. What's it tell us? There's God. <laughs> That's a good starting point, right? What's it tell us about the Trinity? As you read that verse, what does that verse tell you about the Trinity? Well, you've got for God so loved, and you've got what else in there? The Son. Okay, so now you you know something. It doesn't say much about the Spirit. But you do know that God the Father and God the Son. So if you're a new believer and you're trying to wrestle through all these things, you're saying, wait a minute, what's it telling me about God? If God is God and He has a Son, what does that tell me about God? Who said it? Father, yes. All of a sudden, wait a minute, I just want to say about God. He's the Father, He's only Son. Ooh, that's interesting. What happened? And you start wrestling through. And the idea of this is you're, you're putting your thoughts and you're wrestling through what does this verse say? What's it telling me about God? It tells me if God exists. It tells me if God's a father. What else does that verse tell you specifically about God? He's love, yes. He is a God who loves. Okay, so if you have love and you have one party over here, what must you have over here? If there's God, there's love, and there's a... The object of his love. The object of his love. And if God loves somebody, what kind of God is he? He's a loving God, yes. <laughs> That's true. What, what, what else can we learn about him? Personal, Personal God, yes. What else? Start to the R. Relational God. Yeah, he's personal. He can be known personally. He relates to his creatures. He relates to the objects of his love. I mean, let's not think about that. That's the most well-known verse in all the world. Everybody knows John 3, 16. And you can unpack so much out of that verse. What's it telling you about the Holy Spirit? You know, well, not much. Uh, if you know any kind of theology on it, on it the Trinitarian theology, we know that between God the Father and God the Son, the Son is eternally proceeding from the Father, and the Spirit eternally proceeding from both Father and Son. So there's Trinity there. Now, it's not specifically mentioned there. Unless you know a little bit of theology, you won't pick that up. But you can still go, okay, doesn't say too much about that. Move on to the next question. What's it tell you about the attributes of God? Well, He is love. That's one thing for sure. He gave his only son. By the way, now, what kind of love gives? He is an unconditional love. Well, sort of, yes. And think about something else. What kind of love gives? Father's love. It's a father's love, yeah. Who said sacrificial love? Sacrificial love, yeah. I don't know. If you had a West Coast in time. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that costs something. Well, so all of a sudden we realize God's love is not temperamental, like you said, unconditional. 
It's a law that gives, and what does it give? It gives his only. Why does he put the word only in there? But in the original, it's something like his one and only unique, if you unpack the words. So all of a sudden, you're learning something about God. You're learning something about his relationship with his son. You're learning something about his relationship with the objects of his love, which is the world. He knew him, his holiness. What does that verse tell you about God's holiness? Why? 
because they were constantly soaking their minds and chewing over Scripture. And when they could preach it, they could just preach on and on and on and on. And they could draw any verses all over the Bible because they were so saturated with Scripture. Were they, did they have better brains than we did? No. Do we have better tools to study the Bible? Then maybe that's a flat application to do that. I got a tool there that can file scripture and verses and all kinds of stuff thousands of miles faster than they ever could. They had all the books and they didn't have very many of them. They only had a few. And yet, their grasp of scripture outstrips ours a hundred times over because they meditated constantly. They didn't just meditate on verses, they meditated on Topics. Uh, one lady was describing uh, there was four of these pure people, smarties, uh, able, having their breakfast, chewing over how they could meditate on so how you pray all the time. And this lady walked by, she was a washerwoman, and she happened over here in the conversation. She said, Oh, sir, that's easy. I sit up in the morning and, and, I, and I put my feet out of bed on the floor and I give thanks to the Lord that my feet are on the solid rock of Christ and I get up and I go to my door and I open my door and I remember that Jesus is the door by him no more he enters and so I give thanks for the fact that there is a door called Christ and, and she's kept unfolding. You know, I sweep through the, the day with my broom and as I sweep with my broom, uh, she said that the dust of the, the world clouds up and so I sprinkle the water of the word on my situation and as I see the dust settles, and, and she just went through it. She stood there, this, this, this washerwoman talking to these uh, theologians about how she prayed through the day and how her mind was constantly looking around for ways that scripture was brought to mind. You're sitting on chairs. Think about chairs in scripture the throne of God, the seat of the atonement seat, the throne of the king. Let's think about we're going to be seated with Christ. So as you sit down in the chair, you can start chewing your mind over the fact that we have been raised up and seated with Him in the heavenly places. Ephesians chapter two. Uh, you're driving in your car. You come from a stop sign. Um, desperately think of a way to make that one work. <laughs> God puts stop signs in your life to bring order. I mean, you can think of all kinds Pray of things. Pray for the person who walks who comes next to you. Pray for the person in the car beside you. Pray for the guy that just cuts you off. You know, and there's all kinds of ways that you can drill your mind. But I think what it is with them, and as opposed to us, is they had a mindset that was so biblically saturated that they saw the world differently than we did. And their meditating and memorizing and reading scripture changed the way they thought. I want to get to the last place because it's already five after seven. Okay. Um, down on page five, one, two, three, four, five, six points up from the bottom. What other text contributes to the meaning of this text? If you use a cross-reference Bible, you can jump and have a look, or you can think about for God so loved the world. Romans 5 8, God displays his love in this world, Christ. Who gets this Christ died for us? You can unpack that verse. And so you can start leapfrogging your way through the Bible. Right? What other texts contribute to the meaning of this verse? What do these texts tell you about? This verse, what does this verse tell you about those? And off you go. And, and literally, the only thing stopping you from getting more out of it is your time and schedule and, and the discipline of your mind. By the way, just so you know, this is my discipline stuff. Um, John Piper, who is brain, he's got a PhD and he's probably one of the greatest thinkers alive today in Christianity. He tried to sustain one train of thought while he walked around the block and he couldn't do it. He said, my mind just, so I just couldn't do it. So how do you do it? He said, he writes and reads with a pencil in one hand and a paper in the other. Heaven forbid I mention this name for a moment, but Bill Gates. I was watching Bill Gates, the little documentary. I was, I was awake at 3 o'clock in the morning on Friday morning. I couldn't sleep. And I like watching documentaries and smart people. And I found some of Bill Gates. I'm watching it. The guy packs around, no joke, 37 books. Everywhere he goes, he has what he calls think week. He goes off to a play in cabin in Washington State on the lake. He puts his 37 books on the table. He has a whole stack of yellow pads, yellow legal pads, a pencil or a pen, and a whole fridge full of diet pump. No joke. And he reads and annotates. 
and his secretary said, I've never seen him in a conversation where he knew less about the topic than the person he was talking to in 20 years. You've never seen him. Why? Because he used his mind and he constantly engaged his mind and he constantly used a pencil to sustain those trains of thought. You say, well, Bill Gates, brilliant. No, Bill Gates is a brain just like yours. And there's not, the only thing different than you and Bill Gates is he's a multi-billionaire, other times over, and he's probably going to hell from the things I saw in that documentary. I'm hoping for the finds of Lord before, the end comes. But using a pencil and a pad, reading, annotating, writing the things down, it will drive the thinking in your head. It'll also enable you to start expanding your thinking. I've proved it all my life. Only if I write something down, I remember it. If I don't write it down, it's lost in the sawdust back there somewhere. Um, it's about, this is the fourth point from the bottom, it's about active engagement with the text by thinking hard and deeply and peeling away the text layer by layer to gain an understanding of it, to understand what it says, to understand what God is saying to you from that text. God speaks through his word. Paul actually says in 2 Timothy, and my memory isn't very good, but I think it's 3 and verse 7. Don't look up in case I got it wrong. <laughs> he says, if you think deeply, God will give you understanding. There you go. That's meditating. That's wrestling with scripture. Um, Steve, don't look at it. Let's see if I got it right. Um, take every word and phrase and pray it back to God like reading the Bible to ask God to teach you what to do in response to the text. Now this is not the point I want to get to. It's not meditating on scripture to just store away tons of theological information in the brain and carry on. Here's how it works. By sowing, and I mean that like a farmer sowing seeds, by sowing the thoughts of the word of God into your mind and heart, it is hope that I would have prayed that God will bear fruit by producing in you the fruit of God's, the action. So I obviously then jump my thinking right here. What I'm trying to say is, if you put some of the thoughts of meditation into your mind and heart, the outcome of that will be a change of action, something different in your life. You sow a repet repetition of that action. What you create is a habit. You sow the habits and you create character, okay? The old saying is true, so a thought, reap an action, so an action, reap a habit, so a habit, reap your character, so your character, reap your eternity. It's absolutely true. So the whole idea, when you think about this again, we wrap this up. Joshua 1 verse 8. The whole drive of this, uh, what couple of you were talking about here, at least we were this morning about godliness and holiness. The life that we live is to be a life of godliness and holiness. We're not just saved by a statement of faith in God. We're saved because we believe in God and that belief changes our character. So Joshua 1.8 says this, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And the idea of the word meditate, which is the same verse, is a different Hebrew word than the one in Psalm 1. And in this case, it literally means to mumble. So what the, the Hebrew has the idea, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall mumble it day and night. You shall mumble, mutter it to yourself. So it's the idea of memorizing and repeating in an audible sense to yourself the word of God. So that, it's a purpose, right? So that you may be careful to do action according to all that's written in it. The whole point of doing this is to change our actions, to, to develop godly habits that develops in turn godly character. So we're reading scripture to memorize scripture, we're memorizing scripture to meditate on scripture, and we're meditating on scripture to develop godly habits, godly actions, which will in turn develop godly character. Does that make sense? Okay, it's 10 out of 7. Anybody have any questions or comments you want to throw out before we wrap it up? And then I don't know if you're running lost in this either. Yes, sir.
those other things. You're absolutely right. They're all there, right? It's speaking about faith, about perishing, about the gift of God's Son. It's, you can unpack all those different things, but the point I was going to make when I got earlier was the subject by grammar was God. And then the fall on that, yes, it's talking about those other things, absolutely, right? But it's now seeing how those other things connect to the main thing, which is God. So how does faith connect to God? Well, the object of faith is God. So just having faith, that's not salvation. It's faith in God. It's not even faith that God will keep all his promises. It's faith that God is able to keep his promises. Because in your lifetime, God promised you that Christ would return. Now you're 72. 77, I think part In your lifetime, that may not happen. In my lifetime, that may not happen. In my grandchildren's lifetime, that may not happen. That doesn't mean that God's not able to keep his promises. So faith believes that God is able to keep his promises. But in that sentence, God is the main idea, and it's faith in God that prevents us from perishing, for God's sake, yeah. So that, in the great point of God, yeah. Who wants to just for a minute, which I hope is very interesting today, is, is one of the John 3, 16, is, yeah. John 3, 15, which is this, pretty much the same thing. Yes, that's it. Who believes that it will not perish? Yes. And 3, 16, which is your pizza. So I think it's so clear, it follows on it, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. The same thing is said. There was a thing on Facebook, and it was a table, and it, on the front of the table it said John 3, I think it was 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And a line up, and then the table beside that, there was John 3.16 and a line up. And everybody was going to the table just said John 3.16, because John 3.16, 17, and 18 says that those who do not believe are condemned already. Nobody likes that message. And so that's why if you read the part of the memorization I put in there, and this is just simple notes. You can do what you want with them, but um, if you read that there, one of the things that when you're memorizing is memorize a sentence and memorize a string of verses. You're gonna get so much more. And by the way, when you memorize a string of verses, it's far easier to add one verse to a verse you already know because the train of logic will flow through them. Right? And so memorizing John 3, 16 is a fantastic thing for Christian do. But memorizing John 3, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, that's much better because you got a whole train of thought. There's so much more. And like we were saying before, those land verses all reflect on and unpack and explain more of John 3.16, which is already an explanation of John 3.15. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Praying scripture back in, in, in private prayer, the uh, Puritans had three, yeah, three main disciplines of grace. Secret prayer is one, meditation of scripture is the other one, and memorization of scripture, which goes kind of hand in hand with the other one. But there are three main disciplines of grace that they all practice. Secret prayer is a huge one. Taking that scripture and praying through your Bible. So memorize and meditate. And if you meditate on the scripture, like you're saying, the outflow of that becomes prayer to God. Right? Study and theology must end in Doxology or glorify God as all we do. Yeah. Good point, guys. Anybody else need to come in with your I was just thinking to all of you, we can never forget the primary of that. Amen. 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 Yes, that's holding very clearly. I think I've said before from here, your doctrine of scripture affects everything. So if you see the Bible as just written by human authors, you're going to make some horrible mistakes. Uh, some of my Bible school professors, one in particular, his favorite thing to do in class was to push all the other books that we weren't studying to one side 
And he kept saying to me, yes, but what is the, what is the theology of Hebrews? And he was, he was lower than that. He wasn't reformed in any stretch of the word. And so his idea in Hebrews 6 is that you can lose your salvation. And we had a knockdown down drag argument right in class, me and him, because I said, yes, but you cannot divorce the whole line of theology from the theology of Hebrews. It's, they fit together. He said, you know, but you can't, you can't impose Paul out of the eyes of yes, you absolutely can, because it's one book. When you're right, it's one author. And seeing that inspiration of God, and the, when you meditate on scripture, that's going to reinforce that idea, because you're going to see similar logic unpack, you take Romans 5, 8 and John 3, 16. They're essentially saying the same thing, but from different perspectives and different avenues. So it's a little bit looking at the whole the concept of God's love and salvation and just you turn it around as you see in different verses that talk about it. So yeah, and it drives home the idea. One off, absolutely. Alright, I'm gonna close with very well. Loving Father, we come before you again and we just want to thank you for your word. And Father, we thank you for giving us a mind and a brain, giving us the simple tools of paper and pencil. And Father, the immense wealth of the indwelling Holy Spirit. But as we work our way through and chew our way through text, whether it's John 3, 16 or Isaiah 40 or wherever it is, Father, the Spirit of God teaches us and instructs us and trains us and helps us to see the truth of Scripture. But Father, we would not see it as a framed photograph on a wall, something to be admired from a distance, but it really doesn't impact our effect our lives or thinking. Father, we want to be men and women who are saturated in the Word of God, but the Word of God flows through our veins like blood. The Word of God affects our actions, our thinking, our words, our relationships. The Word of God impacts our whole lives so that we are changed into godly men and women. Father, we remember the, those verses in uh, 2 Corinthians 7, I believe, as it says that without, that we must perfect godliness in the fear of the Lord. Father, there is a tremendous call on us to learn and know Scripture that we might know you, that we might be transformed into the image of Christ. Father, again, the text in Romans 12 that tells us to not be conformed to this present world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, renewing them in Scripture, soaking them in Scripture, training our thinking in Scripture, with Scripture. We might be men and women of God. Father, we just thank you. Thank you so much for the tremendous truth that you gave your only begotten Son, the worthless wretches like us, with no call upon you whatsoever to be saved. Father, we thank you that you have worked in our hearts to bring us to Christ, to help us. To see the truth of the gospel, you've communicated it and says, Lord, in baby time, baby language, that we might understand it. Father, thank you for all these things. Thank you for a wonderful day of worship together as a church. Lord, we thank you for the visitors who are here this morning. We think of David and his daughters. We think of Andrew and his son. And Lord, there was another couple back there, an Asian couple, and they didn't get to meet them. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them here. We pray, oh God, that they would have been blessed and encouraged. And if they're not believers, Father, they would walk away thinking about what the gospel truly is. Father, we pray for Wynn and for Jack tonight, who are in hospital, dealing with the sickness and sorrows. Lord, we ask you that you encourage their hearts and strengthen them for the journey. We ask you these things, Father, giving thanks in the name.